section one hundred of england scotland ireland and wales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's story volume ten england scotland ireland and wales edited by eva march tappan section one hundred an irish school early part of the nineteenth century by gerald griffin the schoolhouse at glendalough was situated near the romantic river which flows between the wild scenery of drumgolf and the seven churches it was a low stone building indifferently thatched the whole interior consisting of one oblong room floored with clay and lighted by two or three windows the panes of which were patched with old copy-books or altogether supplanted by school slates the walls had once been plastered and whitewashed but now partook of that appearance of dilapidation which characterized the whole building along each wall was placed a row of large stones the one intended to furnish seats for the boys the other for the girls the decorum of mr lenigan's establishment requiring that they should be kept apart on ordinary occasions for mr lenigan it should be understood had not been favoured with any pestilatian light the only chair in the whole establishment was that which was usually occupied by mr lenigan himself and a table appeared to be a luxury of which they were either ignorant or wholly regardless this morning mr lenigan was rather later than his usual hour in taking possession of the chair above alluded to the sun was mounting swiftly up the heavens the rows of stones before described were already occupied and the babble of a hundred voices like the sound of a beehive filled the house now and then a schoolboy in frieze coat and corduroy trousers with an ink bottle dangling at his breast a copy-book slate voster and reading-book under one arm and a sod of turf under the other dropped in and took his place upon the next unoccupied stone a great boy with a huge slate in his arm stood in the centre of the apartment making a list of all those who were guilty of any indecorum in the absence of the master near the door was a blazing turf fire which the sharp autumnal wind already rendered agreeable in a corner behind the door lay a heap of fuel formed by the contributions of all the scholars each being obliged to bring one sod of turf every day and each having the privilege of sitting by the fire while his own sod was burning those who failed to pay their tribute of fuel sat cold and shivering the whole day long at the farther end of the room huddling together their bare and frost-bitten toes and casting a long envious eye toward the peristyle of well-marbled shins that surrounded the fire full in the influence of a cherishing flame was placed the hay-bottomed chair that supported the person of mr henry lenigan when that great man presided in person in his rural seminary on his right lay a close bush of hazel of astonishing size the emblem of his authority and the instrument of castigation near this was a wooden stroker that is to say a large rule of smooth and polished deal used for stroking lines in copy-books and also for stroking the palms of the refractory pupils on the other side lay a lofty heap of copy-books which were left there by the boys and girls for the purpose of having their copies sought by the master about noon a sudden hush was produced by the appearance at the open door of a young man dressed in rusty black and with something clerical in his costume and demeanour this was mr lenigan's classical assistant for to himself the volumes of ancient literature were a fountain sealed five or six strong young men all of whom were intended for learned professions were the only portion of mr lenigan's scholars that aspired to those lofty sources of information at the sound of the word virgil from the lips of the assistant the whole class started from their seats and crowded round him each brandishing a smoky volume of the great augustan poet 
who could he have looked into this irish academy from that part of the infernal regions in which he has been placed by his pupil dante might have been tempted to exclaim in the pathetic words of his own hero sunt hic etiam sua primia laudi sunt lacrimi rerum et mentum mortalia tangunt whose head was the first question proposed by the assistant after he had thrown open the volume at that part marked as the day's lesson jim naughton sir well naughton begin consther consther footnote construe in the footnote now and be quick at pur ascanius mediis in wallabus acri gaudet equo iamque hos cursu iam creterit illos spumantemque dari go on sir why don't you consther at puer ascanius the person so addressed began but the boy ascanius mediis in wallabus in the middle of the valleys gaudet rejoices exults aragal exults is a better word gaudet exults acri equo upon his bither horse o oh, merther alive his bither horse inag era what would make a horse be bither jim sure tisn't of sour beer he's talkin rejoicin upon a bither horse dear knows what a show he was what raisin he had for it acri equo upon his meddlesome steed that's the construction jim proceeded acri equo upon his meddlesome steed yamque on now preterit he goes beyond outstrips acri preterit he outstrips hosts these yamque illos and now those cursu in his course que and optat he longs very good jim longs is a very good word there i thought you were going to say wishes did anybody tell you that dickens a one sir that's a good boy well optat he longs spumantum aprum that a foaming boar dari shall be given wotis to his desires out fulwum leonum or that a tawny lion that's a good word again tawny is a good word better than yellow descendere shall descend monte from the mountain now boys observe the beauty of the poet there is great nature in the picture of the boy ascanius just the same way as we see young misther kiley of the grove at the fox chase the other day leading the whole of em right and left yamque host yamque illos and now mr cleary and now captain davis he outstripped in his course a beautiful picture boys there is in them four lines of a fine high-blooded youth yes people are always the same times and manners change but the heart of man is the same now as it was in the days of augustus but consther your task jim and then i'll give you and the boys a little commentary upon its beauties the boy obeyed and read as far as pretexit nomine culpum after which the assistant proceeded to pronounce his little commentary now boys for what i told ye them seventeen lines that jim naughton construed this minute contains as much as fifty in a modern book i pointed out to you the picture of ascanius and i'll back it again the world for nature then there's the incipient storm interia magno miseri murmure caelum incipit era don't be talkin but listen to that there's a rumblin in the language like the sound of comin thunder insequitur comista grandine nimbus do you hear the change do you hear all the s's do you hear um whistlin do you hear that black squall comin up the hillside brushin up the dust and dried leaves off the road and hissin through the threes and brushes and do you hear the hail drivin ather and spatterin the leaves and 
whiten in the face of the country comista grandine nimbus that i mightn't sin but when i read them words i gather my head down between my shoulders as if it was hailin atop o me and then the sight of all the huntin party dido and the Trojans and all the great court ladies and the tyrian companions scattered like cracked people about the place lookin for shelter and peltin about right and left heather and thether in all directions for the bare life and the flood swellin and comin thunderin down in rivers from the mountains and all in three lines et tyrii comitis possumet trajana juventus dandanisque nepos veneris diversa per agros tecta metu petieri ruant de montibus omnis and see the beauty of the poet fallen up the character of ascanius he makes him the last to quit the field first the tyrian comrades and the feminine race that ran at the sight of a shower as if they were made of salt that they'd melt under it and then the trojan youth lads that were used to it in the first book and last of all the spirited boy ascanius himself silence near the door spell uncum dido dux set trianus iandum devenient observe boys he no longer calls him as of old pius aeneas only dux trianus there's where virgil took the crust out of homer's mouth in the neatness of his language that you'd gather a part of the feelin from the very shape of the line and turn of the prosody as formerly when dido was askin aeneas concerning where he came from and where he was bound he makes answer est locus hesperiam grai cog nomine di cunt terra antiqua potens armas atque uberi glebi huc curses fuit and there the line stops short as much as to say just as i cut this line short in spaken to you just so our course was cut in going to italy the same way when juno is vexed in talking of the Trojans, he makes her spake bad latin to show how mad she is silence many in capto desistere victam nec passi italia tu quorum aver terri regum quippe vetor fatis palasne excurere classum arguam atque ipsos potuit submergere ponto so he laves you to guess what a passion she is in when he makes her lave an infinitive mood without anything to govern it you can't attribute it to ignorance for it would be a whole thing in earnest if juno the queen of all the gods didn't know a common rule in syntax so that you have nothing for it but to say that she must be in the very moral of a fury such boys as the art a poet's and the janius uh, languages but i kept ye long enough go along to your greek now as fast as ye can and rehearse and as for ye continued the learned commentator turning to a mass of english scholars i see one comin over the river that'll tate you how to behave your selves as it is a thing ye won't do for me put up your virgils now boys and out with the greek and remember the beauties i pointed out to ye if ye haven't the luck to think of em yourselves the class separated and the hundred anxious eyes were directed towards the open door it afforded the glimpse of a sunny green and babbling river over which mr lenigan followed by his brother david was now observed in the act of picking his cautious way at this apparition a sudden change took place in the entire condition of the school stragglers flew to their places the impatient burst of laughter was cut short the growing bit of rage was quelled the uplifted hand dropped harmless by the side of its owner merry faces grew serious and angry ones peaceable the eyes of all seemed pouring on their books and the extravagant uproar of the last half-hour was hushed on a sudden into a diligent murmur those who were most proficient in the study of the master's 
physiognomy detected in the expression of his eyes as he entered and greeted his assistant something of a troubled and uneasy character he took the list with a severe countenance from the hands of the boy above mentioned sent all those names he found upon the fatal record to kneel down in a corner until he should find leisure to hair them and prepared to enter upon his daily functions for the present however the delinquents are saved by the entrance of a fresh character upon the scene the newcomer was a handsome young woman who carried a pet child in her arms and held another by the hand the sensation of pleasure which ran among the young culprits at her appearance showed her to be their great captain's captain the beloved and loving helpmate of mr lenigan casting unperceived by her lord an encouraging smile toward the kneeling culprits she took an opportunity while engaged in a wheedling conversation with her husband to purloin his deal rule and to blot out the list of the proscribed from the slate after which she stole out calling david to dig the potatoes for dinner and so we too will leave the school end of section one hundred this recording is in the public domain section one hundred and one of england scotland ireland and wales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world story volume ten england scotland ireland and wales edited by eva march tappan section one hundred and one the winning back of the land eighteen o eight to nineteen o three by charles johnston and corita spencer great as was the need for emancipation it was as nothing compared to the distress and suffering caused by the deplorable social and economic condition of the country the relations between landlord and tenant were worse than at any past time and every year brought new and heavier taxes instead of lessening the burdens which the people already bore each man in the long series of middlemen as well as the tenant and the landlord at the two ends of the series had to gain a profit from the same acre of land and no one was willing to spend money on improving the quality of the land if it be asked why the answer is simple the tenant held his land from year to year at the will of the landlord and if he made improvements and so increase the value of the land he would be called on to pay a greater rent or leave his holding the middlemen would not make improvements because whoever stood next above them in the scale of extortion would immediately have demanded a greater payment the landlord made no improvements because he was accustomed to think of himself as a man with rights and privileges and never as a man with duties and obligations the result was that a piece of land was allowed to go from bad to worse and was finally rented for an excessive sum to a peasant so poor that he could not improve it in any way and could barely make a starvation wage for himself and his family in england the landlord was the agricultural partner of his tenant investing large sums of money in improvements such as drains fences outhouses and so forth so that the value of the land steadily rose but nothing of the kind existed in ireland frequently whole towns were owned by one man who thus had it in his power to exact what rents he pleased at the time of the union the population of ireland amounted to about four and a half millions it now began to increase rapidly the landlords permitted and even encouraged extreme subdivision of land so that they might collect rents from as many tenants as possible the peasants came to grow potatoes more and more exclusively since this was the cheapest crop and that which most easily sustained life without further outlay it is recorded that often during this time the poor peasant would plant his potatoes at the proper season and then go off to england to work for some english farmer and so try to make a little money meanwhile his family was left almost penniless to beg or borrow he would come back in time to dig his potato crop in the autumn and in this way he could earn more than by growing corn and a variety of crops then we must not forget the innumerable taxes he had to pay and the repeated injustice he suffered at the hands of the middlemen and tax-gatherers it was nothing unusual for a peasant to be forced to pay rent twice over to different middlemen both claiming the same piece of ground and to have his cattle sold before his eyes if he resisted these demands 
all this was known to parliament or at least ought to have been known since it had all been graphically described by irish members but no notice was taken of it the question of the land was now the gravest which remained to be solved it involved the right to work the right to earn food for one's family the right to possess a home a ferment of agitation gradually spread through the country which culminated in the formation of the land league in eighteen seventy nine the inspirer of this movement was michael davitt but it owed much of its success to the commanding genius of charles stuart parnell the land league meant the organizing of a nation in defence of its rights and was far more effective than any armed rebellion its three immediate objects were fair rent fixed hold and free sale by fair rent it was meant that the rent to be paid by a tenant should not be fixed arbitrarily by a grasping landlord but should be justly decided by a court after examining the land and judging of its extent and fertility fixed hold meant that the tenant should be entitled to hold his farm in security without fear of eviction or extortion so long as he paid the fair rent decided on by the court free sale meant that the tenant was entitled to sell his interest in his farm to a new tenant that interest representing the capital he had invested in improving the farm in fencing draining clearing and building the land league represented the organized demand for these things and every detail of the question was made thoroughly clear to the peasants for of every part of ireland at great public meetings addressed by parnell and his lieutenants at first parnell had greatly doubted whether the irish people would take up the land question in a serious way do you think he asked one of the older patriots that the irish people will take part in an agitation for land reform i think replied the patriot that to settle the land question the irish people will go to the gates of hell from ireland the agitation spread to the united states an extensive organization was there formed which set itself the task of providing the sinews of war a parliamentary fund was collected and parnell was soon in a position to provide for his army of parliamentary followers who were thus able to leave their other occupations and devote themselves wholly to the work of reform parnell commanded a parliamentary party of eighty-six members and never was a party so well led and so finely disciplined following the example set by joseph bigger of making long speeches and raising technical obstacles parnell perfected the system of parliamentary obstruction he made it impossible for the english parliament to carry on its work before it had done justice to ireland meanwhile the political situation was rapidly changing in england the conservative government fell and gladstone was returned to power in eighteen eighty as the head of a strong liberal government the land league agitation had penetrated to every part of ireland and had aroused such strong feelings against extortion and injustice that acts of violence and outrage were frequent gladstone proclaimed the land league an unlawful body and its leaders including parnell were arrested and thrown into prison gladstone determined however to settle the question of the land as he had settled the question of the church in eighteen sixty nine he therefore drew up the famous land bill of eighteen eighty one which secured to the irish people the three objects that had been agitated for thirty years fair rent fixed hold and free sale a land court was established with power to hold sessions in every part of ireland to fix fair rents which were thenceforth called judicial rents and to decide on the value of improvements made by a tenant on his farm in order to secure him in the enjoyment of these improvements this was a splendid measure and the good it has done is incalculable the many evils had survived from the past and were destined long to survive a series of crops almost as bad as in the famine years had reduced the tenants to dire poverty and often to starvation yet the landlords insisted on exacting the full arrears of rent which they had arbitrarily imposed before the days of the land court the consequence was that acts of violence increased carried on chiefly by secret societies such as the moonlighters and the invincibles gladstone grew disgusted with the attempt to rule ireland by force and coercion and came to an agreement with parnell then in kilmainham jail under which he was to receive parnell's support in parliament in return for measures beneficial to ireland gladstone's ministry fell from power in eighteen eighty five and lord salisbury and the conservatives returned to office their policy was marked by two principles first steady opposition to the agitation of the land league and the lawlessness which followed in its wake and second an organized methodical and enlightened attempt to remove the causes of irish poverty and misery one by one they passed the first land purchase act in eighteen eighty five a measure to enable the tenants to buy their farms from the landlords and so to be rid of the exactions and the extortions of rent once and for ever 
the english government placed a sum of twenty-five million dollars in cash at the disposal of the irish farmers who could borrow as much as they required to buy their farms at once they were to repay the government by instalments spread out over forty-nine years at the end of which time they would be absolute owners of the soil several thousand more tenants became owners and reduced the amount they had to pay yearly by about one-third this measure has worked admirably and the sense of security gained by the farmers has already begun to call forth the qualities of thrift industry and providence which the former conditions of land tenure in ireland had done everything to destroy arthur james balfour became chief secretary for ireland in eighteen eighty seven in this post he played two widely different roles first as the opponent of the irish party in the house of commons he was cool polite satirical and very determined second in ireland itself he sincerely and effectively studied the wants of the irish people and set himself to devise remedies to meet them the second land purchase bill was passed in eighteen eighty eight by which a second sum of twenty five million dollars was put at the disposal of irish tenants who wished to purchase their farms mr balfour also turned his attention to what are called the congested districts in the west of ireland the condition in these districts has been well described by t w russell one of the most gifted of the liberal unionists a great part of the crowded population of the western seaboard live subject to the most shocking conditions the land is in many places hardly worth cultivating the riches of the sea are not for these poor people they have no boats no capital the skill of the fishermen has ceased to be developed and even were the fish caught the market does not exist that is there are no means of transit thereto struggling for a wretched existence upon these arid patches of soil growing potatoes and little else feeding a pig and rearing a scarecrow of a calf this is the method by which thousands of human beings drag out a miserable existence balfour set himself to remedy this by extending a system of railways through the congested districts obtaining a grant of seven million dollars from parliament for that purpose in eighteen ninety one balfour went very much further he had been convinced by this time and had convinced his party that in land purchase lay the solution of the irish question he obtained a new advance from parliament this time for a hundred and seventy million dollars to be applied for the purchase of farms by the farmers he also formed the congested districts board which was charged with the duty of purchasing land under the purchase acts for the purpose of enlarging and consolidating farms of improving the breed of horses cattle and poultry aiding the fishing industry by erecting piers and boat slips by the supply of boats and fish curing stations and of developing agriculture and other industry thus a constructive period gradually replaced the work of confiscation which england had carried on in ireland during centuries the cultivators of ireland have for over a generation had an opportunity of buying back their lands by instalments more than six thousand tenants purchased their farms under the irish church act of eighteen sixty nine the land acts of eighteen seventy and eighteen eighty one each turned nearly a thousand tenants into proprietors the land purchase act of eighteen eighty five extended the same privilege to two thousand more the land purchase acts of eighteen ninety one and eighteen ninety six turned into owners of the soil no less than thirty seven thousand former tenants arthur james balfour became prime minister in nineteen o two with george wyndham a descendant of lord edward fitzgerald as chief secretary for ireland he decided to settle the irish land question once for all and as far as possible to sweep the irish landlords out of existence parnell had said when the irish landlords are as anxious to go as we are to get rid of them the land question will be practically solved wyndham saw that the time was rapidly approaching when this would be true through the operation of gladstone's land courts the rents had been twice lowered all over ireland a third settlement of these rents was approaching it has long been the custom in ireland to make the selling value of the land depend upon the rent in general land is sold for a sum of money equal to the rent for twenty years thus if the rent of a farm were a hundred dollars a year its selling value would be two thousand dollars in ireland this is expressed by saying that the land is sold at twenty years purchase if the land court reduced the rent to seventy five dollars a year the selling value of the farm would fall to fifteen hundred dollars so much sheer loss to the landlord the irish landlords had now seen the value of their property shrink twice under the operation of the land courts a third shrinkage was rapidly approaching this gave wyndham his opportunity his new land purchase bill included two propositions first to put at the disposal of the irish tenants a sum of english money so large that practically every tenant in ireland could take advantage of it and second to induce the landlords to part with their farms by offering them a bonus equal to about one-eighth of the selling price of the land thus the tenant was able to buy cheap while the landlord sold dear 
both parties being in an extremely satisfactory position wyndham made it possible for the whole nation to buy back the land and for the first time in history a whole people undertook the work of national redemption on the instalment plan wyndham's bill became law and came into operation on november one nineteen o three a government report recently printed sheds a flood of light on the working of land purchase during the thirty-four years preceding wyndham's act it is found that though the land has always been the first care of the purchasing tenants the houses both dwelling and farm buildings have been very materially improved since they became owners of the soil in all the four provinces this is the general testimony new buildings have sprung up old ones have been repaired on some estates where the condition of purchased and non-purchased holdings can be contrasted it is found that while the houses on the former have been much improved on the latter they are in a very neglected state the middleman has been done away with subletting and subdivision are practically extinct tenants will no longer sell part of their farms i could well perceive says one of the english land inspectors the love that these people have for their little homes and how desperate must be their position before parting with them and purchase seems to make them cling to them even more than before not less favourable is the verdict as to the credit and solvency of the new purchasers it is increased all around as is testified to by local bankers and shopkeepers who are in a position to know best a very good symptom is the fact that these new landowners are chary of getting into debt and think twice before they borrow money even when their credit is good we can well see that a great moral change must accompany this steady material regeneration a feeling of safety is everywhere springing up in place of the paralyzing insecurity and doubt that prevail for generations a group of tenant purchasers in roscommon declare that since they have got a hold of the land they have not spared themselves in making improvements which will be their own for all time a parish priest in cavan says that purchase has brought peace the people are more industrious more sober and more hopeful as to their future prospects the police say that before purchase they found the people troublesome and unruly but now all is changed and quietness and order reign instead the tenant purchasers are full of supreme contentment at their altered situation a priest in fermanach says the people in his parish are more industrious now while the consumption of whisky has diminished by a third the evidence of these two ecclesiastics vividly recalls the words put in the mouth of the irish by sir r kane in eighteen forty four we were reckless ignorant improvident and idle we were idle for we had nothing to do we were reckless for we had no hope we were ignorant for learning was denied us we were improvident for we had no future we were drunken for we sought to forget our misery End of section one hundred and one this recording is in the public domain section one hundred and two of england scotland ireland and wales read for librivox dot org by sarah hale an irish cottage photograph page five hundred and forty four this beehive cottage with roped roof is in county donegal and is apparently one of the better sort william elleroy kurtz thus describes one even humbler than this in what are known as the congested districts that is the barren regions in which the irish were forced to settle when their fertile lands were confiscated by the english he says the walls were of rude stones piled one on another without mortar and the roof was made of straw there was no floor but the earth no furniture but the hard wooden bench a table and a three-legged stool there was no window and the only light that there was came through the door which opened into a loosened barnyard where the filth was ankle-deep and the stench almost insufferable the government has for years been striving to induce families to leave these congested districts and remove to more fertile and less crowded parts of ireland in many cases the tenants are given farming implements seeds and aid in restocking their farms often comfortable houses are also provided at no higher rent than had been paid for wretched hovels end of section one hundred and two this recording is in the public domain
Section 103 of England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 10, England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. Edited by Ava March Tappan. Section number 103. The Irish People, 20th Century, by Catherine Tynan. I must warn you, before proceeding to write about the Irish people, that I have tried to explain them, according to my capacity, a thousand times to my English friends and neighbors, and have been pulled up short as many times by the reflection that all I have been saying was contradicted by some other aspect of my country people. For we are an eternally contradictory people, and none of us can prognosticate exactly what we shall feel what do under given circumstances whereas the englishman is simple he has no mysteries once you know him you can pretty well tell what he will say what feel and do under given circumstances you have a formula for him you have no formula for the irish the englishman is simple the irish complex the anglo-irish who stand to most english people for the irish have been grafted on to them the complexity of the irish without their pliability it makes perhaps the most puzzling of all mixtures and it may be the chief difficulty in a proper estimate of the irish character they will tell you in ireland that you have to go some forty or fifty miles from dublin before you get into irish ireland there are a many good irish in anglo-ireland usually in the humbler walks of life whence you shall find in dublin servants car drivers policemen newspaper boys and so on the raciness the vivacity the charm which in irish ireland is a perpetual delight dublin drawing-rooms are not vivacious nor are the manners gracious although the four courts still produce a galaxy of wit and dublin citizens buttonhole each other with good stories all along the streets roaring with laughter in a way that would be regarded as bedlam in fleet street get into irish ireland and the manners have a graciousness which is like a blessing i asked the way in ballyshannon town once the woman who directed me came out into the street and a little way with me and when she left me calling to me sweetly come back soon to donegal which left a sense of blessing with me all that day there was a certain curly-haired woolly who drove the long car from donegal to killy Beggs. i can see woolly yet helping the women on and off the car with their myriad packages can see the delightful grief with which he parted from us his shiny face of welcome when he met us again a fortnight later. To set against Woolley were the car drivers, who certainly are unpleasant if the whip money does not come up to their expectations. We say of such that they are spoilt by the tourists. Yet I remember some who were not spoiled by the tourists, although they were perpetually in touch with them. Boatmen and pony boys at Killarney, and a certain delightful guide whose winning gaiety was not at all merely professional thinking over my country people i say they are so and so and then i have a misgiving and i say but after all they are not so and so they are the most generous people in the world they enjoy to the fullest the delight of giving and what a good delight that is i pity the ungiving people you will receive more gifts in ireland in a twelvemonth than in a lifetime out of it the first instinct of irish liking or loving is to give you something the giving instinct runs through all classes. If you sit down in a cabin and see an old piece of lusterware or something else of the sort, do not admire it unless you mean to accept it, for it will be offered to you, not in the Spanish way, which does not expect acceptance, but in the Irish way, which does. I have many little bits of china given so, usually the one thing of any consideration or value the donor possessed. I once sought to buy an old china dish, much flawed and cracked by hot ovens in a dublin hotel as much to save it from following its fellows to destruction as for any other reason the owner would not sell the dish but he offered it for my acceptance in such a way that i could not refuse when i go back to my old home the cottagers bring a few new laid eggs or a griddle cake for my acceptance i have a friend in an irish village whose income from an official source is ten pounds a year she has a cottage a few hens and enough grass for a cow when she can get one her gifts come at christmas at easter on st patrick's day 
and on some special private feasts of my own eggs sweets flowers a bit of lace or a fine embroidered handkerchief and in times of illness a pair of chickens that is royal giving out of so little and i assure you that it blesses the giver as well as the recipient on the other hand the farmers grow thriftier and thriftier sir horace plunkett and men like him truly patriotic irishmen are showing them the way successive land acts lift them more and more into a position of security from one of precariousness they have more money now to put in the savings banks their prosperity does not mean a higher standard of living although that is badly needed it means more money in the banks that is all the irish are very like the french if the day should come when they should learn like the french to be thrifty and usurious i hope i shall not be there to see it better a thousand times better that they should remain royal wastrels to the end and yet we need not fear it still if you ask a drink of water at a mountain cabin in the poorest parts of ireland you are given milk and do not offer to pay for it lest you sink to the lowest place in the estimation of these splendid givers the hospitality is truly splendid there is a saying in ireland that they always put an extra bit in the pot for the man coming over the hill it is an unheard of thing that you should call at an irish house and not be asked if you have a mouth on you if your visit be within anything like measurable distance of meal time you will be obliged to stay for the meal in england when people are poor or comparatively so or feel the need of retrenchment they do not entertain it is almost the first form of retrenchment which suggests itself to the englishman whereas to curtail his hospitalities would be the last form of retrenchment to an irishman and you will be entertained generously and lavishly by people you know to be poor the englishman's different way of looking at the matter is no doubt partly due to the fact that he is a much more domestic person than the irishman and depends mainly on his family life for his happiness and pleasure now the french do not give hospitality at all outside the large family circle so that in that regard at least the irish will have a long way to travel before they touch with the french i have said that the irish are not domestic they are gregarious but not domestic the irishman depends a great deal on neighbours he has no such way of enclosing himself in a little fortified place of home against all the ills of the world as has the englishman irish mothers like irish nurses are often tenderly exquisitely soft and warm but the young ones will fly out of the nest for all that perhaps the art of making the home pleasant is not an irish art perhaps it is the gregariousness general and not particular at least general in the sense of embracing the parish and not the family to the young irish and a good many of their elders the home is dull they go off to america leaving the old people to loneliness because there is no amusement they do not make their own interests as the slower less vivacious nations do the rainy irish climate seems made for a people who would find their pleasures indoors but the irish will be out and about telling good stories and hearing them they are an artistic people with great traditions yet books or music or conversation will not keep them at home if they cannot have the neighbors in they will go out to the neighbors they are very religious and accept the invisible world with a thoroughness and simplicity of belief which they would say themselves is their most precious inheritance the celt is no materialist he does not love success or riches most of those whom he holds in esteem have been neither successful nor rich money is not the passport to his affections he ought never to go away and alas he goes away in thousands contact with a selfish money-getting materialism has power to destroy the spiritual qualities of the celt once he is outside ireland when he comes back a prosperous irish american he is no longer the celt we loved and he does come back that is one of his contradictions the home he had left behind because of its dullness the arid patch of mountain land the graves of his people call him back again at the moment when one would have said every bond with them was loosened end of section 103 this recording is in the public domain section 104 of england scotland ireland and wales read for librivox.org by sonia wales part 1 
legends of wales historical note when the saxons invaded britain in the fifth century the inhabitants were driven to the westward and mingled with their kinsmen in wales the conquest of these kinsmen was slow for they made a most determined resistance the king arthur of tennyson's idols is thought to have been one of their leaders as was also cadwallon in the eleventh century an english army overran wales but not until the days of william the conqueror did any english ruler succeed in obliging the welsh to recognize him as sovereign this recognition was given most grudgingly and in order to prevent these unwilling subjects from making raids upon the english territories the land along the borders or marches was granted to norman nobles lords marchers as they were called and there they built their strongholds they were an independent folk these marchers but they held back the welsh and therefore they had to be endured end of section 104 this recording is in the public domain section 105 of england scotland ireland and wales read for librivox.org by alan mapstone king arthur by bessie rayner parks when good king arthur ruled this land he dwelt at carlion upon usk he held it with an armed right hand and drank red wine from dawn till dusk how stalwart were the warriors then in our time no such maidens are king arthur was the first of men the fairest dame queen guinevere when merlin waved his silver wand none dared dispute its awful spells on summer nights the moonlit strand was musical with fairy bells and all the knights in arthur's court made glorious that enchanted spot and who was first in every sport ah who was loved but lancelot how bright the armour which they wore when setting out at morning tide the silken banners which they bore by gentle hands were wrought and dyed and who shall rise and who shall fall when they the robber bands assail and whose pure hands shall duty call to seek and find the holy grail fair company of noble knights that ride in that mysterious land and celebrate your mystic rites with stainless sword in stainless hand ah where is carlion upon usk though somewhere in the south of wales the wanderer there at gathering dusk when dreaming o'er these ancient tales will hardly see such lovely dames will hardly meet such noble men till bards and prophets prove their claims and good king arthur comes again end of section 105 this recording is in the public domain Section 106 of England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason in Canada. The World's Story, Volume 10. England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. Edited by Eva March Tapan. Section 106. The Dream of Maxon Wledig from the Mabinogian. Mabinogian is a general term, used for the old Welsh tales and romances. In the following tale, Maxon is that Maximus whom, in 383, his soldiers proclaimed Emperor of Rome. The Editor. Maxon Wledig was Emperor of Rome and he was a comelier man and a better and a wiser than any emperor that had been before him and one day he held a council of kings and he said to his friends i desire to go to-morrow to hunt and the next day in the morning he set forth with his retinue 
and came to the valley of the river that flowed towards Rome. And he hunted through the valley until midday. And with him also were two and thirty crowned kings that were his vassals. Not for the delight of hunting went the emperor with them, but to put himself on equal terms with those kings. And the sun was high in the sky over their heads, and the heat was great. And sleep came upon Max and Wiledig, and his attendants stood and set up their shields around him upon the shafts of their spears to protect him from the sun, and they placed a gold enameled shield under his head, and so Maxon slept. And he saw a dream, and this is the dream that he saw. He was journeying along the valley of the river towards its source, and he came to the highest mountain in the world. And he thought that the mountain was as high as the sky, and when he came over the mountain, it seemed to him that he went through the fairest and most level regions that man ever yet beheld on the other side of the mountain. And he saw large and mighty rivers descending from the mountain to the sea, and towards the mouths of the rivers he proceeded. And as he journeyed thus, he came to the mouth of the largest river ever seen. And he beheld a great city at the entrance of the river, and a vast castle in the city, and he saw many high towers of various colors in the castle. And he saw a fleet at the mouth of the river, the largest ever seen. And he saw one ship among the fleet, larger was it by far, and fairer than all the others. Of such part of the ship as he could see above the water, one plank was gilded, and the other silvered over. He saw a bridge of the bone of the whale from the ship to the land, and he thought that he went along the bridge, and came into the ship. And a sail was hoisted on the ship, and along the sea and the ocean it was borne. Then it seemed that he came to the fairest island in the whole world, and he traversed the island from sea to sea, even to the farthest shore of the island. Valleys he saw, and steeps, and rocks of wondrous height, and rugged precipices. Never yet saw he the like. And thence he beheld an island in the sea, facing this rugged land. And between him and the island was a country of which the plain was as large as the sea, the mountain as vast as the wood. And from the mountain he saw a river that flowed through the land and fell into the sea. And at the mouth of the river he beheld a castle, the fairest that man ever saw. And the gate of the castle was open, and he went into the castle. And in the castle he saw a fair hall of which the roof seemed to be all gold. The walls of the hall seemed to be entirely of glittering precious gems. The doors all seemed to be of gold. Golden seats he saw in the hall, and silver tables. And on a seat opposite to him he beheld two auburn-haired youths playing at chess. He saw a silver board for the chess, and golden pieces thereon. The garments of the youths were of jet-black satin, and chaplets of ruddy gold bound their hair, whereon were sparkling jewels of great price, rubies and gems alternately with imperial stones. Buskins of new cordovan leather were on their feet, fastened by slides of red gold. And beside a pillar in the hall he saw a hoary-headed man, in a chair of ivory, with the figures of two eagles of ruddy gold thereon. Bracelets of gold were upon his arms, and many rings upon his hands, and a golden torquis about his neck, and his hair was bound with a golden diadem. He was of powerful aspect. The chessboard of gold was before him, and a rod of gold and a steel file in his hand and he was carving out chessmen. And he saw a maiden sitting before him in a chair of ruddy gold. Not more easy than to gaze upon the sun when brightest was it to look upon her by reason of her beauty. A vest of white silk was upon the maiden, with clasps of red gold at the breast, and a surcoat of gold tissue was upon her, and a frontlet of red gold upon her head, and rubies and gems were in the frontlet, alternating with pearls and imperial stones. 
and a girdle of ruddy gold was around her. She was the fairest sight that man ever beheld. The maiden arose from her chair before him, and he threw his arms about the neck of the maiden, and they two sat down together in the chair of gold, and the chair was not less roomy for them both than for the maiden alone. And as he had his arms about the maiden's neck, and his cheek by her cheek, behold, through the chafing of the dogs at their leashing, and the clashing of the shields as they struck against each other, and the beating together of the shafts of the spears, and the neighing of the horses and their prancing, the emperor awoke. And when he awoke, nor spirit nor existence was left him, because of the maiden whom he had seen in his sleep, for the love of the maiden pervaded his whole frame. Then his household spake upon him, Lord, said they, is it not past the time for thee to take thy food? Whereupon the emperor mounted his palfrey, the saddest man that mortal ever saw, and went forth towards Rome. And thus he was during the space of a week. When they of the household went to drink wine and mead out of golden vessels, he went not with any of them. When they went to listen to songs and tales, he went not with them there. Neither could he be persuaded to do anything but sleep. And as often as he slept, he beheld in his dreams the maiden he loved best. But except when he slept, he saw nothing of her, for he knew not where in the world she was. One day the page of the chamber spake unto him. Now, although he was page of the chamber, he was king of the Romans. Lord, said he, all thy people revile thee. Wherefore do they revile me? asked the emperor. Because they can get neither message nor answer from thee as men should have from their lord. This is the cause why thou art spoken evil of. Youth, said the emperor, do thou bring unto me the wise men of Rome, and I will tell them why I am so sorrowful. Then the wise men of Rome were brought to the emperor, and he spake to them. Sages of Rome, said he, I have seen a dream, and in the dream I beheld a maiden, and because of the maiden is there neither life nor spirit nor existence within me. Lord, they answered, since thou judgest us worthy to counsel thee, we will give thee counsel. And this is our counsel, that thou send messengers for three years to the three parts of the world to seek for thy dream. And as thou knowest not what day or what night good news may come to thee, the hope thereof will support thee. So the messengers journeyed for the space of a year, wandering about the world, and seeking tidings concerning his dream. But when they came back at the end of the year, they knew not one word more than they did the day they set forth. And then was the emperor exceedingly sorrowful, for he thought that he should never have tidings of her whom best he loved. Then spoke the king of the Romans unto the emperor, Lord, said he, Go forth to hunt by the way that thou didst seem to go, whether it were to the east or to the west. So the emperor went forth to hunt, and he came to the bank of the river. Behold, said he, this is where I was when I saw the dream, and I went towards the source of the river westward. And thereupon thirteen messengers of the emperors set forth, and before them they saw a high mountain, which seemed to them to touch the sky. Now this was the guise in which the messengers journeyed. One sleeve was on the cap of each of them in front, as a sign that they were messengers, in order that through what hostile land soever they might pass, no harm might be done them. And when they were come over this mountain, they beheld vast plains, and large rivers flowing therethrough. Behold, said they, the land which our master saw. And they went along the mouths of the rivers, until they came to the mighty river which they saw flowing to the sea, and the vast city, and the many-colored high towers of the castle. They saw the largest fleet in the world in the harbor of the river, and one ship that was larger than any of the others. Behold again, said they, the dream that our master saw. And in the great ship they crossed the sea, and came to the island of Britain and they traversed the island until they came to Snowdon. Behold, said they, the rugged land that our master saw. And they went forward until they saw Anglesley before them, 
and until they saw Arvon likewise. Behold, said they, the land our master saw in his sleep. And they saw Aber Sane and a castle at the mouth of the river. The portal of the castle saw they open, and into the castle they went, and they saw a hall in the castle. Then said they, Behold, the hall which he saw in his sleep. They went into the hall, and they beheld two youths playing at chess on the golden bench. And they beheld the hoary-headed man beside the pillar, in the ivory chair carving chessmen. And they beheld the maiden sitting on a chair of ruddy gold. The messengers bent down upon their knees. Empress of Rome, all hail! Ha, gentles, said the maiden, ye bear the seeming of honorable men and the badge of envoys. What mockery is this ye do to me? We mock thee not, lady, but the emperor of Rome hath seen thee in his sleep, and he has neither life nor spirit left because of thee. Thou shalt have of us therefore the choice, lady, whether thou wilt go with us and be made empress of Rome, or that the emperor come hither and take thee for his wife. Ha, lords, said the maiden, I will not deny what ye say, neither will I believe it too well. If the emperor love me, let him come here to seek me. And by day and night the messengers hide them back. And when their horses failed, they bought other fresh ones. And when they came to Rome, they saluted the emperor and asked their boon, which was given to them according as they named it. We will be thy guides, Lord, said they, over sea and over land, to the place where is the woman whom best thou lovest, for we know her name, and her kindred, and her race. And immediately the emperor set forth with his army, and these men were his guides. Toward the island of Britain they went over the sea and the deep and he conquered the island from Beli, the son of Manigan, and his sons, and drove them to the sea, and went forward even unto Arvon. And the emperor knew the land when he saw it, and when he beheld the castle of Abersane, Look yonder, said he, there is the castle wherein I saw the damsel whom I best love. And he went forward into the castle and into the hall, and there he saw Kynan, the son of Yudav, and Adion, the son of Yudav, playing at chess. And he saw Yudav, the son of Caradoc, sitting on a chair of ivory carving chessmen. And the maiden whom he had beheld in his sleep, he saw sitting on a chair of gold. Empress of Rome, said he, all hail. And the emperor threw his arms about her neck, and that night she became his bride. End of section 106 this recording is in the public domain. Section 107 of England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 10 england scotland ireland and wales edited by eva march tappan section one hundred and seven beth gilert or the grave of the greyhound about twelve twenty by william robert spencer the llewellyn whose hasty temper was the death of his faithful dog was llewellyn op your ward or llewellyn the great he brought both norman barons and welsh chieftains under his rule and gave valiant assistance to the barons in their struggle to force king john to sign magna carta unluckily for the probability of the story of gelert tales greatly similar to this have been found in russian sanskrit arabian and many other languages the welsh version has been handed down by tradition for seven hundred years and is generally received throughout wales of the so-called tomb of gelert george burrow says the tomb or what is said to be the tomb of gelert stands in a beautiful meadow just below the precipitous side of kerichlan it consists of a large slab lying on its side and two upright stones it is shaded by a weeping willow 
and is surrounded by a hexagonal paling who is there acquainted with the legend whether he believes that the dog lies beneath those stones or not can visit them without exclaiming with a sigh poor galert the editor the spearman heard the bugle sound and cheerily smiled the morn and many a brock and many a hound obeyed llewellyn's horn and still he blew a louder blast and gave a lustier cheer come glaert come where it never last llewellyn's horn to hear o oh, where doth faithful glaert roam the flower of all his race so true so brave a lamb at home a lion in the chase twas only at llewellyn's board the faithful glaert fed he watched he served he cheered his lord and sentinelled his bed in sooth he was a peerless hound the gift of royal john but now no gerlert could be found and all the chase rode on and now as o'er the rocks and dells the gallant chidings rise all snowdon's craggy chaos yells the many mingled cries that day llewellyn little loved the chase of heart and hair and scant and small the booty proved for gerlert was not there unpleased llewellyn homeward hied when near the portal seat his truant gellert he espied bounding his lord to greet but when he gained his castle door aghast the chieftain stood the hound all o'er was smeared with gore his lips his fangs ran blood llewellyn gazed with fierce surprise unused such looks to meet his favourite checked his joyful guise and crouched and licked his feet onward in haste llewellyn passed and on went gellert too and still where'er his eyes he cast fresh blood gouts shocked his view or turned his infant's bed he found with blood stained covert rent and all around the walls and ground with recent blood besprent he called his child no voice replied he searched with terror wild blood blood he found on every side but nowhere found his child hell hound my child's by thee devoured the frantic father cried and to the hilt his vengeful sword he plunged in gellert's side his suppliant looks as prone he fell no pity could impart but still his gellert's dying yell passed heavy o'er his heart aroused by gellert's dying yell some slumberer wakened nigh what words the parent's joy could tell to hear his infant's cry concealed beneath a tumbled heap his hurried search had missed all glowing from his rosy sleep the cherub boy he kissed nor scathe had he nor harm nor dread but the same couch beneath lay a gaunt wolf all torn and dead tremendous still in death ah what was then llewellyn's pain for now the truth was clear his gallant hound the wolf had slain to save llewellyn's heir vain vain was all llewellyn's woe best of thy kind adieu the frantic blow which laid thee low this heart shall ever rue and now a gallant tomb they raise with costly sculpture deck and marbles storied with his praise poor gellert's bones protect there never could the spearman pass or forester unmoved there off the tear besprinkled grass llewellyn's sorrow proved and there he hung his horn and spear and there as evening fell in fancy's ear he oft would hear poor gellert's dying yell and till great snowdon's rocks grow old and cease the storm to brave the consecrated spot shall hold the name of gellert's grave End of section one hundred and seven
this recording is in the public domain section one hundred and eight of england scotland ireland and wales read for librivox dot org by alan mapstone the wearing of the leek an old song translated from the welsh by henry davis cadwallon the hero of the following song was king of wales in the seventh century for many years he resisted the advance of the saxons but was finally defeated and slain at havenfelth in his memory the leek is worn on the first of march the editor when king cadwallon famed of old midst tumults and alarms with dauntless heart and courage bold led on the british arms he bade his men ne'er fret and grieve nor doubt the coming fray for well he knew it was the eve of great saint david's day the saxons in their wild distress of this their hour of need disguised them in the british dress the hero to mislead but soon the welshman's eager ken perceived the craven play and gave a leak to all his men upon saint david's day behold the gallant monarch cried a trophy bright and green and let it for our battle guide in every helm be seen that when we meet as meet we must the saxons proud array we all may know in whom to trust on good saint david's day anon arose the battle shout the crash of spear and bow but i the green leak pointed out the welshman from his foe the saxons made a stout defence but fled at length away and conquest crowned the british prince on great saint david's day we'll cherish still that field of fame whate'er may be our lot which long as wallia hath a name shall never be forgot and braver badge we ne'er will seek whatever others may but still be proud to wear the leek on good saint david's day end of section 108 this recording is in the public domain section 109 of england scotland ireland and wales read for librivox.org wales part 2 stories of the welsh rebellions historical note wales was forced to acknowledge the sovereignty of william the conqueror but the freedom-loving people never fully yielded to norman authority when edward i came to the throne of england he determined to subjugate this troublesome little country first he bade suellen ap griffith come to him and pay him homage of a vassal but the wary prince refused to trust himself in the hands of edward an english invasion resulted suellen was overcome and forced not only to pay homage annually but also to give up a goodly share of his lands in twelve eighty four wales was put under english rule and english laws were introduced according to legend edward planned to appease the pride of the welsh by promising them a prince who had been born in wales and had never spoken a word of english this prince proved to be his baby son who was born at carnarvon in wales the welsh however were not long satisfied with this sop to cerberus and in fourteen o two a formidable revolt broke out under the leadership of owen glendower this was the last national uprising in fifteen thirty six wales was incorporated with england and all the rights and privileges of english subjects were accorded to the welsh 
The history of the country since that date is therefore blended with that of England. End of section 109. This recording is in the public domain. Section 110 of England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Stevens. The World's Story, Volume 10, England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 110. How the Welsh Kept the Christmas of 1115 by Sabine Baring Gould. In the story from which the following selection is taken, Roger has been sent as governor to the district between the Towie and Typhi rivers, and his brother as bishop. The sufferings of the Welsh from the two tyrants have reached the point where they can no longer be borne. The result is the uprising described. The Editor Like an explosion of fire damp in a coal mine, sudden, far-reaching, deadly, so was the convulsion in South Wales. All was quiet today. On the morrow, the whole land from the Bay of Cardigan to Morganoog was in flames. The rising had been prepared for with the utmost caution. The last to anticipate it were the soldiery under Roger, who was quartered in Cairo. Notwithstanding imperative orders from the bishop at Cha Uhadden to return to him, they had remained where they were, and had continued to conduct themselves in the same lawless manner as before. They scoffed at the tameness with which their insolence was endured. They are cunnel conies, de lapin, they said. Footnote, rabbits, and a footnote. Say, whist, and nothing more is seen of them than their white tails as they scuttle to their burrows. For centuries this had been an oasis of peace, unlapped by the waves of war. The very faculty of resistance was taken out of these men, who could handle a plough or brandish a shepherd's crook, but were frightened at the chime of a bowstring and the flash of a pike. Yet, secretly, arms were being brought into the valley, and were distributed from farm to farm and from cot to cot, and the men whose wives and daughters had been dishonoured whose savings had been carried off, who had themselves been beaten and insulted, whose relatives had been hung as felons, were gripping the swords and handling the lances, eager for the signal that should set them free to fall on their tormentors. And that signal came at last. On Christmas Eve, from the top of Pen y Thinus, shot up a tongue of flame. At once from every mountainside answered flashes of fire, there was light before every house, however small. The great basin of Cayo was like a reversed dome of heaven, studded with stars. "'What is the meaning of this?' asked Roger, issuing from the habitation he had appropriated to himself, and looking round in amazement. "'It is the Pulgain,' replied his man, Pont d'Arche, who knew something of Welsh. "'Pulgain? What is that?' "'The coming in of Christmas,' They salute it with lights and carols and prayers and dances. Methinks I can hear sounds. Aye, they are coming to church. With torches, there are many. They all come. Then a man came rushing up the hill. He was breathless. On reaching where stood Roger, he gasped. They come, a thousand men, and all armed. It is a river of fire. Along the road could be seen a waving line of light and from all sides down the mountains ran cascades of light as well. There is not a man is not armed, and the women each bears a torch. They come with them to see revenge done on us. Then up came Cadell. He was trembling. Rogier, he said, this is no Pugain for us. The whole country is stirring. The whole people is under arms, and swearing to have our blood. We will show these conies of Cunwall that we are not afraid of them. They are no conies now but lions. Can you stand against a thousand men? And, this is not all, I warrant, the whole of the Towy Valley and that of Typhi, all Dovid, maybe all Wales, is up to-night. Can you make your way through? 
Roger uttered a curse. I relish not running before these conies. Then tarry, and they will hang you beside Cunoil's bell, where you slung their kinsmen. Roger's face had become mottled with mingled rage and fear. Meanwhile his men had rallied around him, running from the several houses they were lodging in. A panic had seized them. Some, without awaiting orders, were saddling their horses. Hark! shouted Roger. What is that? The river of light had become a river of song. The thunder of the voices of men and the clear tones of the women combined, and from every rill of light that descended from the heights to swell the advancing current came the strain as well. They have come caroling, said Roger disdainfully. Carol, call you this? exclaimed Cadell. It is the war song of the sons of David. Let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee before him. Like as the smoke vanisheth, so shalt thou drive them away. And like as wax melteth at the fire, so let the ungodly perish. I will hear no more, said Roger. Mount, and heaven grant us a day when we may revenge this. I will go too, said Cadell. Here I dare not remain. Before the advancing river of men arrived at the crossing of the Anel, the entire band of the Normans had fled. Not one was left. Then up the ascent came the procession. First went the star for Cunoil, not now in its gold and gem-encrusted shrine, but removed from it, a plain rough ashen stick, borne aloft by Morgan Ap Saisult, its hereditary guardian, and behind him came Meredith with his two attendant bards, all with their harps, striking them as the multitude intoned the battle song that, for five hundred years, had not sounded within the sanctuary of David. The women bore torches aloft, the men marched four abreast, all armed and with stern faces, and Pabo was there and led them. The archpriest, on reaching the church, mounted a block of stone and dismissed the women. Let them return to their homes. A panic had fallen on those who had molested them, and they had fled. The work was but begun, and the men alone could carry it on to the end. Roger and his men did not draw rein till they had reached the Istrid Tawi. The broad valley through which flowed the drainage of the Brecknock Mountains, and there they saw that on all sides beacons were kindled, in every hamlet resounded the noise of arms. At Llandalo they drew themselves into Denevor, which had but a slender garrison, but there they would not stay, and avoiding such places as were centres of gathering to the roused natives, they made for Carmarthen. The castle there was deemed impregnable. It was held mainly by Welsh mercenaries in the service of Gerald of Windsor. Rogier mistrusted them. He would not remain there, for he had heard that Griffith ap Rees, at the head of large bodies of insurgents, was marching up Carmarthen. Next day, the brother of the bishop was again on the move with his men by daybreak and passed into the Clethau Valley, making for Chlau Harden. In the meantime, the men of Cayo were on the march. None were left behind save the very old and the very young and the women. They marched four abreast, with the staff of Cunoil borne before them. Now the vanguard thundered the battle song of David. Cafoded du, Guascara i Elinion, Afoed i Gassion, o i Flyan f. They sang, then ceased, and the rearguard took up the chant. When thou wentest forth before the people, when thou wentest through the wilderness, the earth shook and the heavens dropped. They sang on and ceased. Thereupon again the vanguard took up the strain. Kings with all their armies did flee and were discomforted, and they of the household divided the spoil. Thus chanting alternately, they marched through the passage among the mountains threaded by the San Helen, and before the people went Pabo, wearing the bracelet of Maximus, the Roman emperor, who took to wife that Helen who had made the road, and who was of the royal British race of Cunetha. So they marched on, 
following the same course as that by which the Norman cavalcade had preceded them. And this was the Pulgain in Dovid in the year 1115. The host came out between the portals of the hills at Hlanurda and turned about and descended the Istrad Taui by the right bank of the river, and the daybreak of Christmas saw them opposite Hlangadok. The grey light spread from behind the mighty ridge of Tichrug and revealed the great fortified lonely camp of Khan Goch, towering up with its mighty walls of stone and the huge cairn that occupied the highest point within the enclosure. They halted for a while, but for a while only, and then thrust along in the same order and with the same resolution, intoning the same chant on their way to Hlandalo. There they tarried for the night, and every house was open to them, and on every hearth there was a girdle cake for them. In the morrow the whole body was again on the march. Meanwhile the garrison had fled from Dinavor to Carag Cannon, and the men of Istrid Taui were camped against that fortress from which, on the news of the revolt, Gerald had escaped to Carmarthen. By the time the men of Cayo were within sight of this latter place, it was in flames and tidings came from Cardigan. The people there had, with one acclaim, declared that they would have Griffith as their prince, and were besieging Strongbow's castle of Blindporth. But the men of Cayo did not tarry at Carmarthen to assist in the taking of the castle. Only there did Pabo surrender the bracelet of Maxen to the prince, with the message from his sister. They pushed on their way. Whither were they bound? slowly, steadily, resolvedly on the track of those men who had outraced them to their place of retreat and defence, the bishop's castle of Hauerharden. Now when Bernard heard that all Kaya was on the march and came on unswervingly towards where he was, behind strong walls and defended by mighty towers, then his heart failed him. He bade Roger hold out, but for himself he mounted his mule, rode to Tenby Castle, nor rested there, but took ship and crossed the mouth of the Severn Estuary to Bristol, where he hasted to London to lay tidings before the king, and with him went Cadell, the chaplain. It was evening when the host of Cayo reached Hlauharden, and Roger from the walls heard the chant of the war psalm, God shall wound the head of his enemies, and the hairy scalp of such a one as goeth on still in his wickedness, that thy foot may be dipped in the blood of thine enemies, and that the tongue of thy dogs may be read through the same. He shuddered, a premonition of evil. Pabo would have dissuaded his men from an immediate assault, but they were not weary, they were eager for the fray. They had cut down and were bearing faggots of wood, and carried huge bundles of fern. Some faggots went into the moat, others were heaped against the gates, the episcopal barns were broken into, and all the straw brought forth. Then flames were applied, and the draught carried the fire with a roar within. By break of day, Hlauharden Castle was in the hands of the men of Cayo. They chased its garrison from every wall of defence. They were asked for and gave no quarter. Those who had so long tyrannised over them lay in the galleries, slain with the sword, or thrust through with spears. Only Roger, hung by the neck, dangled from a beam thrust through an upper window. End of section 110. This recording is in the public domain. Section 111 of England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick Seaton The World Story, Volume 10 England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales Edited by Ava March Tappan Section 111 When the Eighteen Fell, 1282 By Owen Rushkamil. On Thursday, December the 10th, 1282, Fluin, ap Grufid, received a message from the plotters, luring him to Aberdeen, 
some miles down the Wye, below Booth, and on the other side of the stream, the snow was lying white on the world, and the rivers, deeper then than now, were running black and full. But the ford across the Wye at Thekrit was still passable. Choosing eighteen of his household men, his bodyguard, Thelwyn, rode to Thekrit and crossed. There he left his eighteen to hold the ford till he should come back, and then, attended only by one squire, young Grono Vichen, son of his minister, and Nevid Vichen, he pushed on down the valley to Aberdeu. At Aberdeu, he was to meet a young gentlewoman, who was to conduct him to a stealthy meeting with some chiefs of that district. If it be asked why he rode thus, almost alone and almost unarmored, the answer is that he was on a secret errand, in which he must not attract attention to himself until he had seen the local chiefs, and arranged all the details of a rising on their part. The more secret and sudden that rising was, the more likely it was to succeed. He was taking one of the risks that a fearless captain takes in such a war. It was like him to do it, for he was a steadfast soul. At Aberdeu, however, the gentlewoman was not there to meet him. In truth, the whole message was part of the plot of Gifford and the Mortimers, though he did not know it yet. Yet as he waited, he thought of how the snow would betray which way he went, either in going to the secret meeting with the chiefs, or in stealing away for safety from any sudden enemies. Therefore he went to the smith of the place, Red Maddock, of the Wide Mouth, and bade him take the thin shoes off the horses, and put them on again, backwards. Anyone finding his tracks after that would think he had been coming, not going. Then, as dark fell, he found the Mortimers with their horsemen were closing in round the place. Danger was upon him indeed. Swiftly he stole away with his squire, and hid himself in a cave which may still be seen at Abadu. All the night he lay hidden, and then, as soon as the earliest grey of dawn crept over the snowy earth, he stole away with his squire again, and rode back to Thekrid. He could only go slowly, so he had to go stealthily, for his horse could not gallop, because of its shoes being backwards. At Thekrid, he found his faithful eighteen, but by this time the river was too high for crossing there. They must find some bridge, now the nearest bridge was the one at Bluff, under the walls of the great castle. Thelwyn believed that by the trick of the horseshoes he had thrown the Mortimers off his track. Also, he remembered that Bluff Castle was to be delivered to him according to promise. He took his eighteen men and rode back to the bridge of Bluff, a great distance down the valley. He reached the bridge barely in time, the Mortimers at Abadu had terrified Red Maddock the smith into confessing the trick of the horseshoes. Like hounds, they were following his trail, and now they caught sight of him, crossing the bridge with his little troop. The bridge was of wood like the rest of the bridges of that district. Thedowin turned and broke it down behind him, the black flood of the full Y mocking the Mortimers as they drew rein on their panting steeds before the broken timbers. Their hoped-for victim had escaped for the moment. In their fury, they turned and dashed back down the valley to cross Erid, now called Erwood, eight miles below. Thelowen expected the castle of Bulith to be given up to him, but the garrison refused, doubtless, making some excuse of waiting till the country had risen. He could not waste time. The bridge on the road to Senibed was gone. He took his eighteen and led the way along the southern bank, the Yervon, to another bridge, just above the little church of Thaninus. There he crossed and posted the eighteen to hold that bridge, doubtless feeling himself safely returned from a great peril. In thankfulness for that escape, too, he caused a white friar to hold a service for him, perhaps at the end of the bridge perhaps in the little church of Thaninus, beside the dark Yvron. 
does not matter much where the service was held. The whole of that ground was to be made sacred that day. This done, Felwyn went up to the garage of Fanvare, a farmstead belonging to the parish church of Bulith, doubtless to get food in an hour's sleep after the cold watching of that winter's night in the cave. After a frosty night of scout work, one's eyes get very heavy when one gets warm next day, and a great drowsiness stills the blood, even of the stubbornest man. Meanwhile the Mortimers had crossed the Wye at Airwood, and with Gifford were riding fast for the bridge of Arroanum, where the eighteen held their post. In headlong haste their leading squadron charged the bridge, but the eighteen had not been chosen in vain. They kept the bridge. While the clamour was at its height, Grano Vaichan roused Thruin and told him of it. Are not my men at the bridge? demanded the prince. They are, answered Grano. Then I care not if all of England were on the other side, returned Thelen proudly. He knew that manner of men he had left to hold that bridge. But down in front of the bridge, where the enemy were shouting in their baffled rage, as they tried in vain to hew away across, one of Gifford's captains spoke out. It was Helius apt Philip Walwyn from lower down the Wye. We shall do no good here, he shouted, but I know a ford, a little distance off, that they do not know of. Let some of the bravest and strongest come with me, and we can cross and take the bridge in the rear. At once the bravest crowded after Helius to the ford where the water seems as dark and deep in winter as the rest of the long black pool on either hand, they crossed. The eighteen were charged in rear as well as in front, but they kept faith, where Thelowin had posted them. There they died, as men should end, proudly fighting, so they ended. Till the eighteen fell, says the bard, it was well with Thelowin up Gruford. Then over their bodies poured all the mass of Mortimer's men, with Giffords to seek Thelowin's little force in the high ground beyond. Fast the horsemen spurred, and as they hastened they came suddenly upon an unarmored man with one companion, hurrying on foot towards where the bridge was roaring under from the trampling host. One of the horsemen, Stephen or Adam of Frankton, in Thelowin's old lordship of Ellesmere, dashed forward with his men, and one ran his lance through the younger of the two. The other one was running up through the little dingle to get back to the army above in time to lead it in the coming battle. On the bank above the little spring at the head of the dingle grew a great spread of broom, Benadel. In the brush of broom, Frankton overtook the man and ran his spear out through him in a mortal wound. That man was Selwyn. The accident had happened. Go to the spot, and the people will tell you that no broom has ever grown again in Thangintim Parish from that dark day to this. So died Selwyn Ap Gruffid, a gallanter soul and of a past to God. End of section 111. This recording is in the public domain. Section 112 of England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 10. England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 112 The Rebellion of Owen Glyndur 1402-1415 By Owen Roscommel Many a victory Glyndur won in the field. He defeated and ruined Grey. But he was a statesman in war too. He made an alliance with the King of France he sent to make alliances with the Scots and the Irish. 
once indeed he formed such an alliance with part of the english against the usurping henry that it seemed for a moment as if he must win all that he dreamt of for one of his generals reith gessin had defeated edmund mortimer in a great battle at pileth in what is now radnorshire capturing mortimer himself now mortimer's nephew the boy earl of march had a better right to the crown of england than henry had so far as the law went henry therefore kept the boy a prisoner at windsor and was glad enough to hear that mortimer was a prisoner of the terrible glindur while he remained a prisoner mortimer could not try to get the crown of england for his nephew but mortimer had a brother-in-law in the famous hotspur son of earl percy of northumberland and hotspur was not pleased that his wife's brother should remain a prisoner he demanded that king henry should arrange for the ransom of mortimer as he had arranged for the ransom of grey when glyndur had captured him henry however refused now henry owed his throne to the help which the Percys had given him glyndur had from the first kept in touch with percy and spared the mortimer possessions plain proof that from the first he had been planning to use the right of the young earl of march against henry henry's refusal to mount some mortimer was the one thing he wanted he entered into negotiations in earnest with hotspur and mortimer to drive out henry he succeeded with both mortimer not only agreed but married glindur's daughter joan the plan was that the Percys should come down from the north and join with mortimer and glindur for a march on london before they started however glindur would have to take the last moment for a fierce campaign against the lord's marchers and the flemings of the south so as to leave cymru secure while he should be gone had the Percys stuck to the plan it must have succeeded in all human probability but it was hotspur who led the men of the north to join owen and hotspur was ever a hothead when he reached cheshire which owen harried from first to last because it was an enemy to henry and found him joined by all that county as well as by the cymra of the nearest cantrebs he thought he was strong enough to pull down henry single-handed he turned east instead of keeping to the plan and marched to join owen it was the old mistake of Luc de Tenay over again, overconfidence, and it had a like result. For Henry was too strong and too ready. Too late Hotspur turned back and took up the original plan again. Henry was too swift for him. Hotspur reached Shrewsbury only to find that Henry, with an army twice as large as his own, was there in the town before him all that bravery could do to retrieve a fatal mistake was done next day in battle but it was done in vain and glendur finishing his work in the south and turning at last to come and meet his ally was met by the news that hotspur had been slain and his army destroyed in one of the bloodiest battles of british history the battle of shrewsbury fourteen o three Yet, though so much was lost in that mistake of Hotspur's, Glyndur never lost heart. He had the true hero soul that, like a star, burns only the brighter the deeper the darkness spreads around it. He still fought on, still made his power felt, still ruled Cymru. He terrified Parliament as no Cymric prince had ever terrified it before. In 1404, Parliament granted leave to the people of Shropshire to pay him tribute to save themselves. In 1408, Shrewsbury refused to open its gates to the king's army for fear of him. The Flemings of Divid paid their price to him after he had defeated them and brought fire and sword to their doors. Countless castles were destroyed. To the bitter end he refused to yield it is not known where he died though it is inferred that he died in fourteen sixteen in gwent they say that he did not die 
they say that he and his men sit sleeping in ogov e dinis buckled in their armour their spears leaning against their shoulders their swords across their knees they are waiting till the day comes for them to sally forth and fight for the land again end of section 112 this recording is in the public domain recording by alan mapstone in oxford england section 113 of england scotland ireland and wales read for LibriVox.org by alan mapstone the march of the men of harlech 1468 national cambrian war song translated by john oxenford while edward the fourth was reigning in england he sent the earl of pembroke against the mighty castle of harlech and demanded that it be given up to him its defender david ennion replied i held a tower in france till all the old women in wales heard of it and now all the old women in france shall hear how i defend this castle he made a stout resistance but was finally obliged to yield to famine the national war song of which the following is a translation is said to have been composed during this siege the editor men of harlech march to glory victory is hovering o'er ye bright-eyed freedom stands before ye hear ye not her call at your sloth she seems to wonder rend the sluggish bonds asunder let the war cries deafening thunder every foe appall echoes loudly waking hill and valley shaking till the sound spreads wide around the saxons courage breaking your foes on every side assailing forward press with heart unfailing till invaders learn with quailing cambria ne'er can yield thou who noble cambria wrongest know that freedom's cause is strongest freedom's courage lasts the longest ending but with death freedom countless hosts can scatter freedom stoutest mail can shatter freedom thick his walls can batter fate is in her breath see they now are flying dead are heaped and dying over might hath triumphed right our land to foes denying upon their soil we never sought them love of conquest hither brought them but this lesson we have taught them cambria ne'er can yield End of section 113. This recording is in the public domain. Section 114 of England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schimpf the world story volume ten england scotland ireland and wales edited by eva march tappan section one hundred and fourteen how a welshman became king of england fourteen eighty five by owen roscommel toward the end of the fifteenth century richard the third succeeded in usurping the throne of england 
his tyranny and crimes by which he had accomplished his object so aroused the english people that they invited henry tudor a descendant of john of gaunt and also of owen tudor a welsh gentleman who had married the widow of henry v to become their sovereign he landed at milford in fourteen eighty five and was soon engaged in a fierce battle with richard at bosworth henry was successful and was crowned on the battlefield as henry the seventh the editor cloudily down the morning of that monday august twenty second fourteen eighty five when henry tudor drew out the host of his gallant countrymen for the battle that was to close a thousand years of struggle it was to close more it was to close the medieval period of british history and to open the modern day the day of our own empire richard the third king that morning drew out his host from its tents at sutton and saw two miles to his left front the host of henry king that night to his right front on hanging hill at nethercoton he saw the host of sir william stanley the men of northeast cambry on his immediate right lay lord stanley's men he sent to order lord stanley to join him but lord stanley would not come then richard measured what he had to do his army was nearly equal in numbers to all the other three combined it was far better equipped and armoured moreover it was composed for the most part of veteran troops there were no sweepings of jails and hospitals with him like the men that henry had brought from france the ground too was all in richard's favour in front of him ran out the long tongue of ambien hill round it on the north and west lay a long winding marsh between him and the other armies that marsh could only be crossed at staniford where the ancient trackway which he had followed from stapleton ran on down from ambien hill to shenton and henry's camp therefore he would take up a position at the end of the ridge of ambien hill overlooking saniford crossing and there wait henry's coming richard was one of the best generals of his day but if he were to march straight off to do it then lord stanley yonder on his right might swing round the head of the marsh and attack him from behind just when the others attacked him in the front that would mean certain defeat therefore he commanded the earl of northumberland whose men were as many as lord stanley's to stand fast where he was and keep lord stanley off then with his eight thousand and more of veterans he set forward along the ridge of ambien hill henry tudor as he drew out his men from the camp at whitmore could look across the marsh and see the plain of redmore beyond it swelling up into the crest of ambien hill on that crest he could see the front of richard's army one wide wave of glittering steel ranging into position he saw what richard intended he knew that he himself must cross the marsh and attack ambien hill every disadvantage was with henry his own men including the worthless foreigners were not nearly so many as richard's he had sent for lord stanley and lord stanley had refused to come to him but he still trusted sir william stanley for sir william's men were Kimry. he knew that the marsh could only be crossed at sandiford the ancient trackway from his camp led to that crossing and onward to richard's position the track would lead him the right way then the marsh would protect his right flank while he marched to Sanford, and there when he turned the head of the column to the right to cross the little stream the troops of sir william stanley would be but a mile or so away behind him on hanging hill then sir william could follow him on over the crossing and join him in the attack it was the only plan now and he marched to carry it out when he came to Sanford, he led the way across the marsh to array his men on redmore beyond still no stanley came but it was ten o'clock and the battle must be fought stanley or no stanley above him rose the steel-crowned crest of ambien and the harvest sun shone dazzlingly into the eyes of his archers as they faced the slope behind them was the wide marsh to cut them off from retreat or flight if they were beaten they were few and the foes were many they were on the low ground and the foe with his cannon was on the high ground to attack now would be boldness indeed but they were bold hearts they attacked when the order was given to prepare lord says the old chronicler how hastily the soldiers buckled on their helms 
how quickly the archers bent their bows and flushed the feathers of their arrows how readily the billmen shook their bills and proved their staves ready to approach and join when the terrible trumpet should sound the blast to victory or death the chronicler used the right word there it was a case of victory or death to the leaders for henry was striking for the crown that meant life and safety to him the exiles were striking for the home that was the only place in the world for them the kimry were striking in the fire of a pride that nothing could kill well might richard feel haunted he looked at all the kimrick banners arranged against him and he called for a bowl of burgundy and turned to his squire reest viken here viken he cried i drink to thee the truest welshman that ever i found in wales and with the words he drank the wine threw the bowl behind him and gave the word for the onset his van was stretched from the marsh on the right to the marsh on the left a very terrible company to them that should see them afar off says the chronicler in the centre were the archers and on either hand of them two wings of men-at-arms covered with steel from top to toe behind them on the hill were richard and his main body with the cannon henry's van was thin because his men were fewer but they were enough the trumpet blew the soldiers shouted the king's archers let fly their arrows but henry's bowmen stood not still they paid them back again then the terrible shot once over the armies came to hand strokes and the matter was dealt with blades henry's tactics were all boldness he still felt that sir william stanley's men must come in for they were kimbry too unlike lord stanley's therefore he pressed the fight on richard's left till his van had outflanked it by this movement he could face the slope now with the sun at his back while it shone in the faces of richard's men dazzling their eyes in turn by this movement too he got richard's army between him and sir william stanley so that it would be taken in front and rear when stanley charged a thing that would mean complete disaster for richard richard saw that and with his cavalry swung round to come on henry's right flank and rear but there was another green spread of marsh where now wave andean woods and it was too soft his good white horse stuck fast shouting for another horse he mounted again and led the thundering charge straight at henry's flank but earl jasper was watching he had the main body of henry's men under him the men of old de Haybarth and with the gallant earl of oxford continued the fight in the van against the duke of norfolk jasper faced his men to meet the desperate richard and beat back his furious onset thus in a ray triangle the fight raged on keenly henry watched the fight now or never was the moment where was will stanley with his kimry in his anxiety he rode back attended only by his bodyguard and standard bearer towards sandiford to where he could see if will stanley was coming and as he drew rein to look one of richard's men saw him and sped away with the news to his master richard was pausing for a drink from the spring which is to this day called king richard's well when the word was brought to him he saw at once that he still had one last desperate chance if he could reach and kill henry then the victory would be his seeing that there would be no one left for henry's men to fight for he seized the chance let all true knights follow me he shouted and spurred away over the hill to where he should find henry fast poured the flower of richard's knights after him while henry's bodyguard saw the onset coming and closed its ranks to defend him richard marked the great standard that sir william brandon bore and he charged upon it like a demon he unhorsed huge sir john cheney who tried to bar his way he slew the standard bearer and laid a hand upon the standard itself but giant reese of mered of nant conwy seized it from him and drove him back a breath while henry himself met him with a fury that astonished friend and foe richard raged like a madman but it was all too late now sir william's men were here at last richard ap howell of moston with the rest and the best king richard was borne back fighting like ten men yet still borne back his horse fell his lords and knights were dead or dying fast around him 
Still he raged on. Then came dark Resap Thomas, seeking the king who had once threatened him, and tradition tells how the blade of dark Reese ended the life of the last Norman king, Richard the Third. The fall of Richard was the end of the battle, too, for all his men fled at that. Northumberland laid down his arms. There was no more to fight for. Lord Stanley, whose troops had never struck a blow, hurried over to Henry, whose men were following the flight of the vanquished. But all was not done yet. The long, fierce dream of the stubborn Kimry were to be fulfilled to the very letter. They had come into England to win the crown of Britain, back for one of the old blood of its founder. They did it in very deed. For when the chase was ended, the crown of dead King Richard was found in a hawthorn bush, and Lord Stanley lifted it and placed it on the head of Henry. Thus was the long dream fulfilled. The crown of Britain was come back to the descendant of its founder at last, and the wild shout of triumph with which the victors hailed their countryman king is remembered to this day in the name of the field in which they stood and watched him crowned. Its name means the field of the shout. You may still see the stone whereon that crowning took place. It is in Stoke Golding, and the spot is still called Crown Hill, in memory of the only time that ever a king of England was crowned on the field of battle. Lost in battle, that crown had come back in battle. Did the bones of all the slain generations of the Kimry who had struggled for this day stir in their red graves at that shout? Surely their spirits knew when the work was done at last. Surely a sound like the moving of a mighty wind must have swept over Kimry, for the ghost of all the heroes slain in the battles of the thousand years of struggle could leave their graves at last and go to God. The long work done, the victory won, the Nunc Dimittis chanted o'er the mountains as they passed. End of section 114. This recording is in the public domain. Section 115 of England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Wales, Part 3. Scenes of Welsh Life. Historical Note. The devotion of the Welsh to their country and its customs, and to literature and music, brought about the establishment of the A. Stedford, a musical festival which is attended by many thousand persons. The word A. Stedford means a session or sitting, and originated perhaps long before the Christian era in the Gorset, which was in great degree a political assembly. Although the Gorset lost its political power, it retained a strong hold upon the people of Wales as a means of encouraging the love of music and poetry and of preserving the national customs. Chairs were established or conventions where musicians were trained. Four of these now exist in Wales. It was probably at some time during the 6th century that Eisteddfordai began to be held, and for many years they took place triennially. Every means was employed to improve the music and encourage the musicians. Rewards were given, a silver harp to the chief musician and a silver chair to the chief bard. During the last 50 years, many local Eisteddfordai have been held, and a provincial one almost every year. The latter must be proclaimed by a bard, who is a graduate of one of the chairs, a year and a day before the time set. When the day arrives, there is first of all a gorset meeting, announced by the blast of trumpets. Here, deserving candidates receive the degree of bard. At the close of the celebration comes chair day, or the time of rewarding the prize winners. End of section 115. This recording is in the public domain. Section 116 of England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brianna Childs. Facebook.com slash author Brianna Childs. The World's Story, Volume 10. England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 116. The Estedfod by Jeanette Marks. 
It was the first morning of my first Welsh national Estedfod, and I sat by the window working and glancing away from my work to a hillside up which led narrow steps to the summits above, among which were hidden away some half a dozen tiny villages. Colwyn Bay, where the Estedfod was to be held, was, as the crow does not fly, about forty miles distant. It was a glorious morning of sunshine in which gleamed the river, glossy beaches and pines, and little whitewashed Welsh cottages. As I looked, there began to emerge from the steps a stream of people. Down and down they flowed, bright in their pretty dresses or shining in their black Sunday bests broadcloth. All those mountain hamlets up above, reached by the roads passable only for mountain ponies, were sending their men, women, and children to the Welsh festival of song and poetry. Talking and excited about who would be chaired as bard, who would be crowned, what female choir would win the choral contest, what male choir, and discussing a thousand little competitions, even to a set of insertions for sheets, shams, and towels, we were borne on the train from Bretis Sukhoid, swiftly through the Vale of Conway, beside the river, past Carhun, the once ancient city of Canovium, past Conway Castle with its heart-shaped walls still encircling the town, and so to Colwyn Bay. Then all these enthusiastic people who had climbed down a hill to take the train climbed up another to see the first corset ceremony. As we passed, from one of the cottages was heard the voice of a woman screaming in excitement, Mrs. Jones! Mrs. Jones, come to the front door quickly! There's some people going by! They're dressed in blue and white! Dear me, Mrs. Jones, they're men! The procession, fully aware that Mrs. Jones and all the little Joneses and all the big and middling Joneses, too, had come, went on gravely up, up the hill to Ifanarig, the flagstaff, where stood the log of the Gorsed and its encircling stones. The paths were steep, and even bards and druids are subject to imbum point. Old Eostar, who can sing Penelion with never a pause for breath, lost his wind, and the bearer of the great sword of Gorsed was no more to be found. A boy scout, perhaps thinking of Scott's minstrel, who said, The way was long, the wind was cold, the minstrel was infirm and old, was dispatched downhill after him, and found him and the sword, arm in arm, lagging comfortably behind. Juridical deportment is astonishingly human at times. But the hilltop achieved, and when recovered, the bards soberly made their way into the juridical circle of stones that surround the great Gorsed stone. Nowhere, as the archdruid remarked, had the bardic brotherhood been brought nearer heaven. From the summit, north, east, south, west, the soft valleys, the towering mountains, the secluded villages, the shining rivers, and the great sea were visible. And there, on this hilltop, the bards, druids, and ovates, dressed in blue and white and green robes, celebrated rites only less old than the Eye of Light itself. After the sounding of the trumpet, Corn Gulad, the Gorsed prayer was recited in Welsh, Grant, O God, thy protection, and in protection strength, and in strength understanding and in understanding knowledge, and in knowledge the knowledge of justice, and in the knowledge of justice the love of it, and in that love the love of all existence, and in the love of all existence the love of God, God and all goodness. Then the archdruid Dyfed, standing upon the gore-said stone and facing the east, unsheathed the great sword, crying out thrice, Awis hedoch, is it peace? And the bards in Ovates replied, hedoch, peace. 
There are some scholars who question the identity of the Bardic Gorsed with the Druidic system. The Welsh Gorsed, this side of the controversial point, is 40 centuries old, and in all conscience that is old enough. Diodorus the Sicilian wrote, There are among the Gauls makers of verses whom they name bards. There are also certain philosophers and theologists, exceedingly esteemed, whom they call druids. Strabo, the geographer, says, Amongst the whole of the Gauls, three classes are especially held in distinguished honor, the bards, the prophets, and the druids. The bards are singers and poets, the prophets are sacrificers and philosophers, but the druids, besides physiology, practiced ethical philosophy. As far back as we can look into the life of the Cambri, poetry, song, and theology have been inextricably woven together. The Gorsed was then formally, for the Welsh people, what it still is informally a popular university, a law court, a parliament. The modern Gorsed, with its twelve stones, is supposed to represent the signs of the zodiac, through which the sun passes, with a central stone, called Meinschlog, in the position of the sacrificial fire in the Druidical temple. A close reverence for nature, a certain pantheism in the cult of the Druids, shows itself in various ways, in the belief that the oak tree was the home of the god of lightning, that mistletoe, which usually grows upon the oak, was a mark of divine favor. The most prominent symbol of the Gorsed is the broad arrow, or mystic mark, supposed to represent the rays of light which the Druids worshipped. Even the colors of the robes of the Druids Ovates and bards are full of characteristic worship of nature. The druids, in white, symbolical of the purity of truth and light. The ovates, in green, like the life and growth of nature. The bards, in blue, the hue of the sky and in token of the loftiness of their calling. Up there on the hilltop, with its vast panorama of hill and valley, sea and sky, Time became as nothing. The Gorsed became again the democratic white Nechmad of the Welsh, and there still were represented the mountain shepherd, the pale collier, the lusty townsman, the gentle knight, the expounder of the law, the teacher, and the priest. But if upon the hill time was as nothing, down below in the gigantic Estesbad pavilion, some 10,000 people were waiting. Gallant little Wales, which has certainly awakened from its long sleep, was past the period of rubbing its eyes. It was shouting, calling for the Estestvad ceremonies to begin. Perhaps, as the folk in Kerwis had called impatiently in the days of the 12th century, or again in that old town in the days of Elizabeth, the last, that memorable Estetfad, when a commission was appointed by Elizabeth herself to check the bad habits of a crowd of lazy, illiterate bards who went about the country begging. That great Estetfadic pavilion, where the people were waiting good-naturedly but impatiently, is a primarily a place of music. Even as in the world, so in Wales music comes first in the hearts of mankind and poetry second. And it may be, since music is more social and democratic, that the popular preference is as it should be. The human element in all that happens at the Welsh Estesfad is robust and teeming with enthusiasm. It is true that prize-taking socks, shawls, pillow shams, and such homely articles no longer hang in festoons above the platform as they did some twenty or thirty years ago. Now the walls are gaily decorated with banners bearing thousands of spiteful-looking dragons and pennants inscribed with the names of scores of famous Welshmen. 
and with such mottos as Aguirre and Urban Abid. The Truth Against the World. Gulad Amabinagion, the land of the Mabinagion, Kalon Earth Kalon, Heart with Heart, and others. After the procession of dignitaries was seated upon the platform, a worried-looking bard began to call out prizes for every conceivably useful thing under the sun, among them a clock tower which he seemed to be in need of himself as a rostrum for his throat-splitting yells. During these announcements, the choirs were filing in. A pretty child with a cello much larger than herself was taking off her hat and coat, a stiff, self-conscious young man was bustling about with an air of importance, and in the front, just below the platform, sat newspaper reporters from all over the United Kingdom, busy at their work. Among them were the gray, the young, the weary, the dusty, the smart, the shabby, and one who wore a wig, but made up in roses in his buttonhole for what he lacked in hair. There were occasional cheers as some local prima donna entered the choir seats and many jokes from the anxious-looking master of ceremonies. At last the choir was assembled, and a little lady, somebody's good mother, mounted upon a chair. The choir began to sing, Come, sisters, come, where light and shadows mingle, and elves and fairies dance and sing upon the meadow land. The little lady never worked harder, her baton, her hands, her head, her lips, her eyes were all busy. Was it the Celtic spirit that made those elves and fairies seem to dance upon the meadows, or did they really dance? The next choir was composed of younger women, among them many a beauty-loving face. Alas, too pale and telling of hard life of the hills, or of the harder life of some mining town. Of the third choir, the leader was a merry little man, scarcely as high as the leader's stand, with a wild look in his twinkling eyes as he waved a baton, and the choir began, Far beneath the stars we lie, far from gaze of mortal eye, far beneath the ocean swell, here we merry mermaids dwell. He believed not only in his choir, but also in those mermaidens, and so did the little lad, not much bigger than Hoffman when he first began the tour, who played the accompaniment. When that choir went out, a fourth came in, still inviting the sisters to come. At last the sisters not only came, but also decided to stay, and another choir lured the sailor successfully to his doom, and all was over, for even in choir tragedies there must be an end to the song. The gallant little mother had won the first prize, it takes the mothers to win prizes, and the audience thought so too. The crowd yelled and stamped with delight. When one asks oneself whether Surrey, for example, or such a state as Massachusetts in America, could be brought to send its people from every farm, every valley, every hilltop, to a festival thousands strong, day after day for a whole week, one realizes how tremendous a thing this Welsh national enthusiasm is. Educationally, nothing could be a greater movement for Wales. To the Welsh, the beauty of worship, of music, of poetry are inseparable. Only so can this passion for beauty, which brings multitudes together to take part in all that is noblest and best in Welsh life, be explained. Only so can you understand why some young collier, pale and work-worn, sings with his whole soul, and shakes with the song within him, even as a bird shakes with the notes that are too great for its body. These Welsh sing as if music were all the world to them, and in it they forget the world. Behind the passion of their song lies a devout religious conviction, and their song sweeps up in praise and petition to an almighty God who listens to Shelley's Ode to the West Wind, as well as some great hymn. To hear 10,000 Welsh people singing, Land of My Fathers, each taking naturally one of the four parts, and all singing in perfect harmony, is to have one of the great experiences of life. To hear Shelley's ode, set to Elgar's music and sung by several choirs, to hear that wild, 
far traveling winds sweep along in a tumult of harmonies, to know that every heart there was as a lyre even to the last breath of that wind, to hear that last cry, O oh wind, if winter comes, can spring be far behind? To listen again to those choirs late in the evening on the station platform with the sea dim and vast and muting the song to its own greater music is to have felt in the Welsh spirit what no tongue can describe. It is to understand the meaning of the word huil, that untranslatable word of a passionate emotionalism. All that went on behind the scenes the audience could not know. They saw only those considered by the adjudicators fit to survive. They did not see the six blind people, for even the blind have their place in this great festival, who entered the little schoolroom off Erbergele Road to take the preliminary test. The girl who played the harmonious blacksmith and, shaking from excitement and holding on to her guide, was led away unsuccessful. They did not see the lad who played Men of Harlech crudely, his anxious, aging, work-worn mother sitting beside him, holding his stick and nodding her head in approval. All they heard were a selected two who were considered by the judges fit to play, a man both blind and deaf who performed a scherzo of, of Brahms and a Carnarvon sea captain, now blind, who played on the violin. The quiet of the one-time sea captain's face laid against the violin. The peace and pleasure in the lines about the sightless eyes would have repaid the whole audience, even if the violinist had not been an exceptionally good player, for listening. One of the inspiring and amusing events of the week was the discovery of a marvelous contralto. A young girl, shabbily dressed and ill at ease, came out to sing. Everything was being pressed forward towards the crowning of the bard, one of the great events of the Estefad. People were impatient and somewhat noisy, but as the girl began to sing, they quieted down. Then they listened with wonder, and in a minute you could have heard a pin drop in that throng of ten thousand. Before she had finished singing, Jesu, lover of my soul, the audience knew that it had listened to one of the great singers of the world. When she had finished her song and unclasped her hands, she became again nothing more than an awkward, silly, giggling child whom Theotegith had to hold by the arm. The audience shouted, What's her name? Maggie Jones, he replied. That begins well. Where does she come from? demanded the crowd. Police station, answered Theotegith lugubriously. The audience roared with laughter and demanded the name of the town. Maggie Jones is the daughter of Police Superintendent Jones of Puechali. Perhaps in the years to come, the world will hear her name again. There are children at these Estefado whose little feet can scarce reach the petals of a harp. Even the Romans, singing up in the high pavilion roof, who had joined in music from time to time, trilling joyously to Handel's Oh, had I Jubal's lyre, twittered with surprise that anything so small could play anything so large. But no one of the thousands there, even the children, grew tired for an instant, unless it was these same robins, who were weary at times because of the cheerless character of some of the sacred music sung in competition, and themselves starting up singing blithely and gladly as God meant that birds and men should sing. The robins twittered madly when some sturdy little Welshman stepped into the Penelian singing, accompanied by the harp, no more to be daunted than a child stepping into rope skipping. When the grown-ups had finished, two little children came forward and sang their songs, North Wales style. The afternoon was growing later and later, it was high time for the name of the bard of the crown poem to be announced. At last, with due pomp, the name of the young bard was announced. Everyone looked to see where he might be sitting. He was found sitting modestly in the rear of the big pavilion, and there were shouts of, Dimavo, here he is. Two bards came down and escorted him to the platform, where all the druids, the ovates, and bards were awaiting him. The band, the trumpeter, the harp, and the sword now all performed their service. 
the sun slanting down through the western windows onto this bardic pageant. The sparrows flew in and out of the sunlight, unafraid of the dragons that waved about them and the bands that played beneath them, and the great sword held sheathed over the young bard's head. The sword was bared three times and sheathed again as all shouted, Hedoch! The bard was crowned, and the whole audience rose to the Welsh national song. What is the meaning of this unique festival of poetry and song? Mr. Lloyd George, who had escaped from the din of the battle outside, and the jeers of the Goths and Vandals who couldn't, or wouldn't, understand the fourth form, said amidst laughter that there was no budget to raise taxes for the upkeep of the Estesfad. Then he continued, The bards are not compelled by law to fill up forms. There is no conscription to raise an army from the ranks of the people to defend the Estesfad's empire in the heart of the nation. And yet, after the lapse of generations, the Estesfad is more alive than ever. Well, what good is she? I will tell you one thing. She demonstrates what the democracy of Wales can do at its best. The democracy has kept her alive. The democracy has filled her chairs. The sons of the democracy compete for her honors. I shall never forget my visit to Llangolfen Estherpad two years ago. When crossing the hills between Flintshire and the Valley of the Day, I saw their slopes darkened with the streams of shepherds and cottagers and their families going towards the town. What did they go to see? to see a man of their nation honored for a piece of poetry, and the people were as quick to appreciate the points as any expert of the Gorset, and wonderfully responsive to every lofty thought. Yes, unlike any other gathering in the world, the Estadfad is all that. Long ago, in the latter half of the 18th century, Iolo Morganug stated the objects of Welsh bardism, to reform the morals and customs, to secure peace, to praise or encourage all that is good or excellent. This national festival is the popular university of the people. It is the center of Welsh nationalism, the feast of Welsh brotherhood. Only listened to in this spirit can one understand what it means when an aesthetic throng, after the crowning of the bard, rises to sing... Pain, blood, fly, not I. Old land that our fathers before us held dear. End of section 116. This recording is in the public domain. End of The World's Story, A History of the Word in Story, Song, and Art, Volume 10, England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales, edited by Eva March Tappan.